I'd love to quickly hear about your background, sir. Uh, share some information with people, and then how Nextcloud got started. Yeah. Yeah, I'm doing open source for a long time, as you said, since the 90s. So I have a lot to talk about. Um, yeah, but I mean, I have a background of uh, as an engineer. Um, I studied computer science, and I wrote like my first code when I was I don't know 11 years old or something. <laughs> so background of uh, of an open source or as a developer, and then lo later, of course, open source. So I was. Uh, um, like in the middle of the 90s, I think 1996 or 97, I got in contact with KDE, with the KDE desktop. A friend of mine showed me uh, uh, KDE 1.0 beta something, I don't know, <laughs> uh, at SUSE at the time. And I was really like blown away about like the software itself, but also the aspect that this is all done by volunteers over the internet, like not by a company. But really by like just like yeah just people uh coming together over the internet and writing code together and then creating something which is in my opinion was uh, really as good as as windows or other software um yeah and then i got got hooked i mean i don't know i started to read like the mailing list to understand how everything works looked at code contributed a bit um and then yeah more and more um was also a board member of the kde ev for some time and um yeah, I started a bunch of other open source projects and uh, contributed to this to some more all kind of different roles. And then, of course, uh, started Nextcloud. Um, Nextcloud is like the most successful of my ideas of my, the code I, I did and the communities I created. Um, it's a bit like um, over six years old now, getting close to seven now. And of course, it's an open source solution um, for protecting privacy and security for of people working together and communicating over the internet, which is, as you said, is always for me the the most important thing that people should have like the IT and their data and their communication under control, but still have like great software. That's really what we do at Nextcloud here. <laughs> I love it. Are there some uh, some metrics or uh, that you might like to highlight or something that makes you really proud from? Like, can you this <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I'm very deep in the development. I mean, I don't write that much code anymore, but um, I am just talking with a lot of people and coordinating things. And um, then you always like deal with problems, you know? It's like, oh, this is not working. There's another bug. This is something we need to fix. And then, I don't know, you're really like are deep into like, yeah, uh, how the sausage is, is made basically, right? Like really the, the, the the deep details of the project but what makes me most happy is then if you talk to people or users of nextcloud and then you see that they're really happy they really like their work and we have like of course millions of users all over the world using nextcloud on a day-to-day -day basis and um, yeah this makes me very happy also there are a bunch of um, organizations who are doing really humanitarian work i mean some of the from the Red Cross uh, to just a bunch of NGOs, people in Asia or in Africa who couldn't afford like uh, commercial proprietary software using xCloud, which makes me very happy. Uh, even like some humanitarian organizations in Ukraine at the moment using xCloud uh, for their logistics. And this is what makes me very proud. This makes me very happy. So that actually all the work is um, that yeah goes into nextcloud is actually making the world a little bit better. So that's a, that's a good thing. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for spreading all this effort uh, over the years. And today, the organization, um, what, what does it look like in terms of uh, the number of people working full-time on Nextcloud, the number of contributors? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this is interesting. It's like, um, because I have this um, long, 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 lots of years background of uh, working as a volunteer for open source project or for KDE. For example, it, there's no company behind it. It's just a hundred percent pure volunteer organization. Um, but uh, when I started Nextcloud, I thought that the combination is probably something that makes sense. Um, so we have a lot of volunteers also at Nextcloud, uh, but there's also a company uh, where we pay people to work like full-time contributing code to Nextcloud. And that's something which I think in our uh, situation here works very well. Um, but you have to do the right, the right balance between both sides. So you asked about the numbers. Um, if you look at it, it's hard to, to measure open source, like metrics are hard to measure. But um, if you look at GitHub, then you can see that we have over 2,000 uh, contributors to the core of Nextcloud alone. 
it's a really it's a really big community. Um, then there, um, and this is only the core. Of course, there are also apps. There's extensions around Nextcloud. There are translations and all kinds of other things. So there's actually a lot more people um, contributing to to Nextcloud um, as volunteers. And there's also the company. Uh, we are a bit like 85 people at the moment. 85, 90 people uh, working full time on on Nextcloud. Um, and this is something, yeah, that is paid by um, support and subscriptions that we sell to to big companies where we get the money from, and then we are able to pay um, for the for the development of this open source software. I love it. I love it. Could you maybe take us a step back earlier on how you approached uh, monetizing such a project uh, and maybe challenges you faced there, or if it was simple? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is such a gigantic, huge topic. I cannot cover this in this interview, but like uh, to, to find to monetize or to 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 create this business model about open source is a, it's a gigantic topic. With mm -hmm. I don't know, I'm thinking and working in this area for I don't know 15 years in different roles in different organizations. Um, so um, I'm really happy with the situation where we are with Nextcloud at the moment, but it was really, really a lot of work to get there. So what we do at the moment is that we are um, following the business model that Red Hat and SUSE and MariaDB and several others has, which in my opinion is the only really good working open source business model, uh, which is like selling support subscriptions. So um, the software is open source. There is no open core. There are no proprietary pieces. Everything is in the open um, and they can use it. As I said, millions of people just use it. Um, but if you're a bigger organization, then maybe you want to like directly talk with the people who wrote the software, you have support tickets, you have feature requests, you want to have training, you want to have, I don't know, special packaging, knowledge base around all kinds of things that you need to run it like in a mission critical way. Um, and that's what we sell as subscriptions. And like I said, it's very similar to Red Hat and SUSE, even Ubuntu and others where the software is free. I mean, look at, for example, at Ubuntu as an example, um, the software is free. A lot of people use it for free, but they also sell these support subscriptions for enterprise users. And yeah, that's what we do too. And this works quite well. I, I understand this is a, you know, this can be a very lengthy conversation topic, but if, if I can just follow up with one single question before we move on, which is uh, you mentioned how you think this is the only model that makes sense. Uh, could you just briefly touch on this? But your... <laughs> Yeah, well, there are lots of different, uh, well, lots of different opinions how to do that. There are is also a different, uh, like a second uh, school of people who are big fans of this open core model. Um, I'm not a fan of that. The model is that, that um, only the core of a product is open source, and then you have a bunch of uh, enterprise extensions around it, and they are proprietary. Um, and the idea is that you can say, hey, it's open source, here it is. And you can do some things with it maybe, but if you really want to use it in a professional way, you'll need these other extensions. And, the, and these extensions or these pieces, features, you need to buy from the company. It's just normal licensing business model, like, like with Windows and I don't know, Oracle and all this other proprietary software. You need, just need to license the software pieces because without these pieces, the whole thing does not work. So I, I'm not a big fan of this model for lots of reasons. First of all, it's not really open source, right? It's, you use basically open source as a marketing tool, as a, as a trigger to, I don't know, make people interested. But then if they really want to use it, they realize they, they really can't. Um, and I think this is just false marketing. So I'm not a big, big fan of that. And there are lots of other reasons because then you go into a situation where the community and the company have to work against each other somehow, because then the community tries to re-implement all these uh, enterprise features as open source and the company has to block it because they're like, no, 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 this is something you need to pay for. You cannot have it for free. And this just creates all kinds of messy situations. And I'm just uh, not a big fan of that. Um, I, I really like the support model more. I, I appreciate uh, hearing your thoughts here. Thanks for sharing. And uh, with you know thirty years uh, in this in this space, would you say that something as of late is is different? If you probably point your finger at it, I mean, commercial open source today, you know, we wouldn't be having this conversation ten years ago necessarily. So what's different today? Yeah. 
to describe it, yeah. Regarding uh, commercialization or overall? In Regarding commercialization space. of open source and the ecosystem broadly, the use yeah. of open source by industry, all these things together, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the use of open source, of course, has exploded. Um, I mean, this already started uh, in the 90s with uh, Linux itself, of course, as like uh, the first or uh, only real freely operating system, which made it possible that everybody can run like an internet server, which made the growth of the internet uh, possible in the first place, because yeah, without open source, everybody would have to buy like, I don't know, like a, like a sun server, sun workstation or something like that, which was crazy expensive. So this would not work. Um, and of course, since then it really exploded, like um, most of the infrastructure nowadays like, I don't know, databases, application servers, frameworks, uh, containerization, lots of those infrastructure in the, in the middle, middleware basically is open source nowadays. And this is a real, real shift. So open source is now, I don't, I don't, I don't know how you can really fully write like software nowadays without using any, any open source component. It's really in the middle of everything. Um, yeah. And of course the communization uh, was, is something that really got big now but with lots of different models i mean as i said some i like some i don't really like um there's also some weird models i mean if you look at for example at android mm -hmm. that's a huge success story right like android is like uh, billions of users and um it's open source um but the problem is of course again it's not really open source um because if you just go to your shop and you buy an android phone then uh, the software that's actually on this phone is not open source. It contains some open source components, but it also has some proprietary components, drivers, Google services, all kinds of things. So it's it's really interesting. It's um, it's 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 really interesting. Um, yeah, there, it's hard to see a, how it goes in the future. Is there is there a prediction about the future, or maybe somewhere you personally would like to see things going? Say it's twenty thirty now. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh predictions i'm not really sure i'm not really good with that but something that i'm thinking a lot lately is uh, the whole um explosion the whole hype around ai and machine learning um just caused something the last few months with chat gpt and this other services really really got very popular and i'm thinking a lot about this and what this means for open source because like forever i was fighting for yeah open source like having the source code freely available but with machine learning, the interesting part is actually not the software. The software part is quite boring. The interesting part is the data and the, the training data and the model, which is, yeah, nothing to do with software. It's data, basically. And I think um, it's it's a bit of a, a threat to the open source movement. Uh, and we really have to expand um, the like the definition of open source also in the areas of yeah, machine learning, data, uh, ML models uh, and, and other things, um, because otherwise, in the future, like you ask in, in thirty years or, or, or ten years, I don't know, in a few years, we still have the software, but we cannot really do something useful with it. Um, so, like data is an interesting focus area. Absolutely, and, and how accessible the data is, and uh, you know who's who's mm -hmm. all of it. Abs absolutely, yeah. uh, and, and this can be a rabbit hole in of itself for a conversation, <laughs> but uh, I, I'm. <laughs> I'm curious to ask you, if someone is getting started today, say someone's out of college and seeing all this mm -hmm. activity in the space, uh, maybe working on a side project, open sourcing, is there some piece of advice that uh, you could give uh, people today? Or a lot of them? Oh, there's so many things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, I would recommend to, um, to work in the open as much as possible. There are still a lot of people who think that, oh, I don't know if my code is good enough. I don't know if the idea is good enough. I don't know if documentation is good enough. So I I do it for myself on my local hard disk. And then maybe in the future, I open source it or like show it to other people. I would give the advice to really from day one work in the open because it's so, it's so rewarding to get input and feedback from others and maybe contributors and can learn from each other and communicate with, with others. So I would say if you play around with technologies, do it in the open and share it with the internet, you will get so much back. So this would be an advice for me. 
Thank you. Thank you, Siri. Duly, duly noted. And is there someone, uh, you know, colleague, someone else in the space that you personally follow or think, you know, shares good nuggets of advice that we could mention? Or maybe another project that, you know, you think is really good? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I I don't think there's a single person. Uh, mm. There's a single person who is doing. Uh, um, I don't know which has the, the ultimate wisdom. Or I don't know, <laughs> but I think there's a there's a there's a, a combination of. I'm always a big fan of like looking into the technology side, but also looking into the the ethics basically around it too. So I think there are a lot of open organizations who are doing who are doing good things. I mean. The Free Software Foundation Europe, for example, or the Open the Open Source Initiative, and others who are just making sure that the licenses and all the ethics around open source is very um, yeah, solid and well protected. I mean, these are organizations who I recommend to follow. There are of course also organizations who do work around like protecting privacy and mm -hmm. security, which is also something that I really care a lot about. Um, and, and then also technology itself too. Right, but I cannot really point out a single project which I think is so, I don't know, revolutionary at the moment. I mean, I really like, yeah, I really like projects that are create software that that are really usable for like normal people. I mean, it's easy to come up with an open source idea to hack up, hack to, to hack on some framework or some libraries in the middle, and this is a good thing, of course, but. I really, I really think we should also care about how to have a positive impact on like normal people. So I like, like developers or like projects who do like really useful things for everybody, every, everybody's day to day life. I mean, just a short example. I'm listening to podcasts a lot, like all the time, and uh, there's a very nice uh, podcast player, uh, Pocketcast, uh, which was uh, open source last year. Um, I think this is a great software, which is super nice, super useful, as um, at least as good as proprietary ones, a fully open source. You can contribute to it. You can see how it works from the inside. I think this kind of project I really like a lot because it improves just the life of normal people. I love it. And it's important to have this perspective. Uh, and uh, is, there, is there something we could say about uh, the ecosystem in Germany or Europe as a whole when it comes to, you know, funding businesses and doing open source today uh and you're probably following everything much more than i am we had forced them recently so i don't know if it's something to be said yeah um from an open source perspective i'm not really sure what to say about germany or europe because i think really good open source projects are totally international i mean we in next lot we have people from everywhere in part of the community even in the company uh, we have like people from 15 different countries uh, all over the world um, so i think I, I always see this as global international projects and initiatives so i cannot really say too much about that um, from a funding perspective um, it's of course true that uh, what people say that in in, in europe or especially germany it's it's hard to get like venture capital money compared to the US. Uh, but I also consider this a good thing in a way. Um, because you are, I don't know, it's it's a bit more sustainable. And it's less like, mm -hmm. I don't know, hyping up an idea, getting millions of funding and then blowing it up two years later, because there was no, no business model behind it. I, I don't know, I'm just, I just personally don't like this too much. And I think the, 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 the startups and companies and projects uh, around open source in Europe are mostly a little bit more down to earth, which I, I personally like. Interesting insight here. Um, is, there, is there something we could say about funding or any piece of advice, maybe in terms of the order of operations when you pursue it for your project and, and specifically for commercial open source projects too and founders? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't really know. I'm not really sure I'm really the best person to answer that <laughs> because, I mean, I, I in the former, in a, in, a, in the project before, in the company before, I also took some venture capital company, what based in the US by then. Um, but this, for the reasons I said earlier, this didn't really work out too well. I'm just not, I don't know. I'm always say that I like to take the money from customers, not from the bank or from investors. So, um, yeah, I don't. I don't know. If I'm not the best person for that. I'm just a bit. I'm not a big fan of like um, external money, to be honest. 
I mean, I mean, you said it great. Uh, demand from the customers. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks, thanks for once again uh, giving your opinion here. Uh, and um, you know, it can, it can it can vary how to what extent people can bootstrap or not. But uh, but yeah, that's duly noted uh, piece of advice here. Uh, and and yourself, as I understand, for next cloud today, that's how you went about approaching it. And uh, yeah, yeah, uh, is yeah, exactly. So we we. we... Um, is there, no, I, 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 is there I, I, any, is there sorry, any other, pardon me, is there, uh, looking back, uh, you know, and from starting next cloud, uh, is there any piece, uh, is, is there something you would do different? Uh, is there some other pitfall that, you know, people could avoid? You mentioned already funding, for example. Yeah. It could be. A I mean, there's nothing big, but there, of course, there are some things that you learn over time. For example, um, something that is really important in my opinion is that you always are super clear how what your business model is and how you really want to make money and you're really focused 100 percent on that they're always like i don't know shiny objects left and right of the road which uh, i don't know um but you should really focus on what you really want to do one example is um a professional services or consulting or i don't know project work basically this is something it's relatively easy to get like money from from customers to implement features or i don't know to do trainings and workshops and and, and things like that but you have to be careful to not um, distract uh, have a distraction from your real business model so from my perspective there are product companies who really develop a product and then sell it or in our support uh, our case sell support for it or um, there are consulting companies um, who um, do just work. They're just developers for hire. And there are not a lot of examples, actually I can think of none, of successful companies who do both in parallel. You're either focusing on implementing the project for customers, or you have your own product and then sell the product. And uh, from my perspective, you should do the product part is more sustainable. And this is where you should focus on. Absolutely. And, and it might be a hard, it might be a tension to navigate early on when, you know, if you choose to bootstrap uh, until you get to the point where, you know, the project has to be sustainable, maybe you need to do some contract work on the side or even better with your customers, offer some services. Yeah, but eventually, but be careful not to go too deep into that um, offering services um, approach. Yeah, there's obviously a chicken, chicken egg problem. Um, and, and the bootstrapping is, uh, it's not easy. I, I, I totally agree. But yeah. Is there is there something uh, in the roadmap of Nextcloud for this year that you might like to, to briefly talk about or a, or a milestone? I mean, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, we are planning and not only planning, we are doing and developing good, uh, great things at the moment. I am just personally not a big fan of pre-announcement, so I don't really like that. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, there is, we actually plan like a huge announcement huge announcement in the in the in the second uh, half of march uh, in just a few weeks and uh, yeah i just would invite everyone to check out our homepage by at the time um, and yeah we really will do very interesting things around um yeah privacy security ai and other topics yeah i love it so everyone will uh you know keep uh, keep their eyes on uh it's in march is there um from your your kind of like your personal life and navigating the challenges of being a founder and being building in the open is there any piece of advice there that you might like to um share with people not it's very open ended but you know <laughs> <laughs> we are exactly where, where where should I start maybe maybe I mean maybe, yeah in terms of managing the community as well which sometimes might get the best of you um we'd love to hear about that you've been doing it for a long time and yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah so first of all about like uh, uh being a founder i would say that y you should you should consider to found a project or a company or an organization around a topic if you're really passionate about the topic because this is not just a normal job i i see so many people or some people starting companies with their only goal is like to get rich 
and uh, this usually does not work <laughs> because it's not that easy um you really need to put a lot of passion and energy into into something to build something up and that's only realistic you can only do that if you really care about the, the mission and the topic and the product at all and then yeah if you really are able to um yeah build up a team with the same passion around it then you you might get successful with it but the motivation should be to build like a good product or i don't know have a real vision behind it and if the only motivation will be to i don't know found a company to sell it later and get rich then in my perspective this is not a very good motivation and most of the time it does not work um you really should care about the, the mission and the, the, your customers in the first place and then you ask about community yeah um yeah obviously community is, is a very important thing because if you start a company an organization you're tiny right at the beginning you're one person with the idea and uh and you don't have customers and you don't have, don't have money and there's no way to hire someone because you have have no resources um and a great way to get out of this problem is of course with a community that is like put your idea in the open um, as I did uh, in this case um, and then suddenly people come and say oh this is interesting can I be part of it can I work can I help with that and then with the help of the community you can really you can really uh, yeah get going and and, and make it relevant um, but for the community of course it's also important that you are super transparent and super fair with them because it's community doesn't mean that suddenly have people work for free that's not how it works um so it really has to be balanced and fair and open like in, in all directions um and this is something where open source licenses are of course a good thing because they guarantee that um yeah everybody can use the software they build on their own too because who would build like like as a volunteer proprietary software for a company and there's, there's no motivation but that's one of the strengths of of open source to make sure that you have this equal playing field between everybody, which is key for building up a community. Absolutely. Um, you know, as of recently, we've been seeing commercial open source, you know, growing and growing, but uh, it, it's still probably just a fraction of the overall uh, open source landscape. And so is there anything you could say about, you know, about FOSS and how that is supported today, how um, you know, if the sponsorships coming from from big companies or or individuals like get the job done, what's what's to say there? Because, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's so many different um, different situations or yeah scenarios. I mean, we we just talked about the the company or the commercial open source part, um, but as you mentioned, there are so many projects that where no, there's no company. Which mm -hmm. someone just as, as as a volunteer, and for some the project might be small enough, then it can be sustainable just as a hobby. Um, but sometimes the these components are these libraries are so crazy important that you really need someone looking into it uh, full time, and then it can be can be challenging. I mean, we we had a, a situation the last few years with like libraries like Open SSL, which obviously is a code where the whole internet is built. <laughs> built uh, on top of um, and then um, yeah but the software that no one really maintained it like uh, full time it was always just some volunteers and then the software has like a, a serious uh, security problems which um, yeah is, is, is a problem so there are a number of initiatives for trying to solve that um, for example in, in, in Europe we see a big movement of um, building up um, like uh, organizations who uh, are funded by the government who then um, like uh, are sponsoring uh, open source projects uh, if they're really mission critical that's something that is um, yeah I think quite quite important I don't know there can be something with donations a little bit but this is always a bit hard to to be sustainable so I think it's it's a bit it's a it's a challenge if something is just a random project on on github and you it's mission critical for you but it's not clear who maintains it and who fixes the parks and where the money comes from. One of the challenges of open source. Yeah. 
definitely. Yeah, yeah. And, and then open space for, uh, you know, new things to come about. Have you yourself, uh, from your daily work and, and your teams and your users, have you identified any opportunities for improving the experience of the maintainers, the community, but are not out there today? Uh, or to phrase it differently, where do you personally experience pain points and, and your team? Yeah. Um, because a lot is left to be figured out still. And so... Um, Maybe some people listening might say, oh, that's that's a problem I might want to look at and see if I can build them. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Have you identified any opportunities for improvement in your experience and that we don't have today? There are lots of, lot, there are lots of opportunities, but uh, um, I, I, let, let's say I, I see a lot of challenges. Uh, right. <laughs> but uh, like uh, the, 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 answers, <laughs> the yes. answers are sometimes or the solutions are, are, are not, that, not that easy. I mean, there is... That's a problem with the whole learning curve. I mean, um, like writing software is, is hard. And I mean, learning a certain programming language is, or even framework or something that's doable, but to really understand how a, co a complex piece of software works. I mean, if you if you look at Nextcloud, for example, and really want to contribute something to the core of it. Yeah, I mean, you, you need some time to understand how the whole software works before you're able to like, fixing a bug or contributing a feature to the absolutely core. And this is the same for other software, trying to improve LibreOffice, for example, or try to improve Firefox. I mean, this is software that is so complicated um, that it's really, really, really hard for a volunteer. You cannot just like, oh, I have two hours on the weekend. Let me con contribute something to Firefox. This is not going to work. Um, so that's a challenge. So we need, may have to make it easier somehow to get into complicated software. Uh, I don't have a good answer for that, um, but that's definitely something to improve. Um, yeah, the whole the whole testing, um, like the whole testing infrastructure, is something which is also getting more and more complicated. I mean, just building and testing and deploying in continuous integration is something it's obviously a big trend and it's a good thing but it requires a lot of resources like lots of hardware and also time to execute all those tests again this is something that if you're a company which has a lot of resources lots of servers um, um, organization can do that but if you're just at home if you're just a student um, that can be a challenge i mean I don't know, for example, I, I'm not sure that a random student can just execute all the tests of Firefox or LibreOffice just at home on, on the local laptop. I don't think this is really possible. So um, this infrastructure that you actually need to, to develop and yeah, do software is getting more and more complicated and yeah, this makes it harder to contribute. That's not a challenge, which I'm not really sure. I mean, there are always like GitHub is providing lots of infrastructure for testing nowadays, but I charge a ton of money for that. So again, it goes back to the money challenge. Yeah. Uh, totally, and I'm sure people listening, maybe some of them might might be instructed to to, to look a little further. <laughs> uh, quick note about students that you yeah. mentioned. Do you think you know open source software and contributing to it and going through the learning curve? Like, could it be more actively part of people's like education or practical experience? With, and and if you have any thoughts, oh, yes. on, yeah. Um, yeah, um, absolutely. Um, I'm. Um, if you look at how people at college or universities uh, learn uh, software development nowadays, I think they'll do more and more with open source. Um, but to be honest, I'm not. I'm still a bit surprised that it's not that they're not hundred percent in. So there's still a lot of students who never really contributed anything to an open source project. But in my experience, it's really the best, but the perfect thing. You can you get feedback from other people immediately, so it's great to learn. Um, and of course, you're also giving something back to the world, which is a good thing. So from my perspective, like um, working with open source, contributing to open source, this should be the absolutely core of of um, education if it's about writing software. I think it's just a modern way of 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 developing software in the in in the open uh, via Git to get with other people. I think it should be the in the core of the yeah computer science education. Absolutely, and uh, you know this can be a topic for a future conversation. But I'm sure everyone would like to see more open code and open data from research that happens at universities. 
uh, and uh, and you know, as I said, that can be a separate topic. But I don't know if you can add something to this uh, real quick from the, from the yeah, hundred percent. And this is uh, yeah related to what I said earlier about the challenges of machine learning, where access to data uh, is is so important. And I, I think organizations like universities who have access to data, if it's I don't know, whatever data it might be, <laughs> they should like same as code um, have it in the open to make it available to everybody to um, to access it to do interesting things with it. It might be machine learning or it might be something completely different, but um, access to data is is so important. Uh, and uh, yeah, also government organizations who collect a lot of data can be anything, right? Can be traffic data, can be weather data. I don't know. All this stuff should be open because it is. Um, yeah, key for the future. Well said, and and a lot of the research is actually funded by the governments and the European Union, and so it mm -hmm. should all be accessible for, to the people. Absolutely, uh, and then you know I hope we can yeah. discuss about this more in the future. Since we're we're running out of time here, is there any last thoughts uh, or remarks you might like to leave people with? Um, yeah, I mean, I only want to say that um, a lot of people, especially young people, that look at our computerized world, um, the internet everywhere, and think that everything has to be the way it is today. Um, but as an old person, <laughs> I can tell you that um, all the way the internet works, how social networking works, the way cloud works, this is all built by humans, uh, like you and me. And uh, if we don't like certain things, for example, if you don't like how social networking works nowadays, we have the opportunity to change it and improve it. And as software developers, we can actually do that. And yeah, I just want to encourage everybody to um, yeah, think about the world and what I can contribute to. And with code, we actually can make a big difference. And uh, yeah, be a little bit idealistic and uh, help to improve things. Absolutely. I'm getting inspired by your words right here, right now. So, so thank you very much. And uh, let's, uh, you know, let's leave it with that. I, I, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity here to interview you, Frank. Thank you so much for your time. And I think there's a lot of uh, very, very valuable information here and people will be coming back to it. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. <laughs> thank you. Okay.